Thank you for your kind words. I want to thank uh, ASGBI for their kind invitation, Dr. Moorhead, Dr. Carlson for, uh, for inviting me to give this keynote lecture. Uh, what I'm going to do uh, in my 30 minutes is essentially share with you uh, our findings in the area of tumor blood vessels. And uh, the key point I would like to convey is that blood vessels in solid tumors are abnormal, both structurally and functionally, not only in animal models, but also in patients, cancer patients. And this abnormality fuels uh, tumor progression and resistance to treatment. And what our laboratory has done for the last uh, decade and a half is try to tame these blood vessels, try to normalize their function. And what I'm going to show you is the evidence for normalization, not only in animal models, but also in cancer patients and show you how repairing or re-injuring or normalizing these blood vessels or taming these blood vessels can improve at, uh, the outcome of therapy. Uh, the, as Harvard University requires, these are my disclosures uh, for uh, uh, the financial disclosures, as well as I'll discuss the off-label use of uh, a number of uh, agents, bevacizumab, sedarinib, sunitinib, serafinib, plerxifor, and losartan. So our laboratory has been looking at a tumor as an organ for nearly four decades. And this organ is made of cancer cells, shown here in the gray color. But these cells, and these cells are nourished by blood vessels uh, formed by the process of angiogenesis, and they're drained by lymphatic vessels. And all these cells are embedded in an extracellular matrix made out of collagen or hyaluronic acid, et cetera, et cetera. And in addition to these cells, they are a number of host cells that are in this organ, in this tumor, and they include uh, fibroblasts, myofibroblasts, stellate cells, depending on the organ, uh, resident uh, immune cells, such as uh, myeloid cells, macrophages, and transiting immune cells, uh, such as T cells, that come into the tumor and leave, or some of them stay here. Our laboratory has been looking at each component of this tumor microenvironment using what is known as intraviral microscopy. And this approach allows us to open the black box of what's inside the tumor using uh, microscopy. So in our laboratory, we, uh, we visualize events inside a tumor by placing a glass window on the top of these tumors. And we have windows like this in the back skin of a mouse to look at melanomas, for example, windows on the brain of a mouse to look at uh, uh, glioblastoma, or brain metastases, windows in the breast to look at breast cancer, on liver to look at liver cancer, HCC, on pancreas to look at pancreatic cancer, and so on and so forth. And what this approach allows us to do is look at in real time what is going on inside a solid tumor. And at this magnification, you can see these very large blood vessels. But if you wish to see smaller caliber blood vessels, we utilize a number of microscopy techniques. This is a technique that allows us to look at blood vessels in the brain of a mouse. And in this corner, there's a glioblastoma, a brain tumor is going. And you can see the blood vessels in the glioblastoma look very different from that of the surrounding normal tissue. And as I'll show you shortly, that these vessels are not normal. And this microscopy technique allows us to look at 3D visualization. So in this case, the yellow blood vessels are at the very top of the brain surface. And as we go deeper, the, the color is darker and becomes absolutely red. So this way we can get three-dimensional construct of blood vessels in an organ. Uh, in addition to be able to look at blood vessels in an organ which is accessible from outside, such as brain, breast, etc., we can also look at blood vessels uh, growing inside uh, our body, such as using, uh, using endoscopy to look at blood vessels in the colon. So we have developed microscopes that allow us to look at, at very high resolution, blood vessels in the colon of a mouse. And these are the blood vessels uh, which are fluorescently labeled, so you can visualize them. And you can see these blood vessels are very nicely arranged, so there are no regions of hypoxia. All cells in this colon tissue is very well oxygenated. All of these cells are extremely well oxygenated. Now, if you take a genetically engineered mouse model that has APC min mutation, the mutation that leads to human colorectal cancer, and now we carry out similar endoscopy and similar microscopy, we'll see shortly that the blood vessels are no longer normal. So this is an 11-week-old mouse, genetically engineered mouse model, that has the APC min mutation, and you can see the blood vessels are already beginning to look abnormal. If you wait a couple of more weeks, 
week 13, you see the blood vessels are even or more abnormal. And if you, this is a 16-week-old mouse, and you can see the vessels are, there's some regions in the tumor that are avascular. You cannot even see any blood vessels there. So you can imagine that if you're injecting any chemotherapeutic agent or any agent uh, uh, that would reach these regions of the tumors very nicely, but these regions will have uh, trouble in ex uh, accessibility uh, because of uh, lack of blood vessels here. Now, it's possible that these abnormalities I just showed you are only an artifact of using animal models. So we decided to look at blood vessels also in tumors from patients. So uh, some of um, two, uh, we collaborated with the Dr. Norm Wallmark when I was a professor at, at Carnegie Mellon University. And one of his uh, fellow at that time, uh, who's right now chief of uh, surgical oncology at University of Chicago, Mitch Posner joined my lab, along with a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. And they developed vascular cast of six human colon cancer. And essentially they injected a a monomer from the, into the artery of this tumor until it came out of the vein after a section. And then they put a catalyst until it came out of the vein. And then they took this whole tumor and put it in KOH solution for about a month. So it ate away all of the tumor. The only thing that was left was the polymer cast. And you can see the blood vessels in this human tumor are also abnormal, similar to what I showed you in the previous slides uh, about a, a similar tumor in mice. Now, if you look at a higher magnification of these tumors, what we see is the blood vessels are pretty well perfused in this region of the tumor, but this region of the tumor does not seem to have any blood vessels, but that is not the case. If you ever take this tumor and stain with a CD31 or any uh, antibody that recognizes endothelial cells, one would find the blood vessel density in this part of the tumor is the same as the vessel density here. But the reason we cannot see these blood vessels is because the blood flow is shut down here, as shown in this, if we look at the same in the real time. So that you see the blood supply is pretty brisk in this region of the tumor. But this region of the tumor, the blood flow has shut down. So as a result, this region becomes hypoxic. There are problems with the, uh, the, uh, the pH becomes acidic. And in addition to that, what we have learned from our work over the years, that these blood vessels are fairly leaky. And as a result, they are unable to contain the hydrostatic pressure, and that transmits from the inside to outside the blood vessel, and that raises the, the fluid pressure in tumors. So the combination of low of hypoxia, that is low oxygen levels, low pH, and high fluid pressure fuels tumor progression and treatment resistance, and it does that through multiple mechanisms. The hypoxia leads to abnormal blood vessels. It causes inflammation. It causes immunosuppression. It leads to fibrosis. It leads to resistance to radiation therapy, number of chemotherapeutic agents, immunotherapy. It, it induces cancer stem cell phenotype. It leads to something known as epithelial mesenchymal transition. It increases the invasion of cancer cells. It increases metastasis. It causes resistance to various death mechanisms, such as apoptosis and autophagy. It leads to change in metabolism to anaerobic metabolism, causes genomic instability, and leads to unfolded protein response. So as a result of all these adverse effects of hypoxia, low pH, and high fluid pressure, our laboratory decided about 15 years ago how to, to focus on strategies to alleviate hypoxia. And what I'm going to do in the rest of my presentation is show you two such strategies that we have tested first in mice, and then they have now been tested in patients. So what I want you to do is do a thought experiment with me. The only way you can decrease blood supply, or oxygen supply to a tumor, is either decrease the blood supply through blood vessels or increase the consumption. So what we decided to do in our laboratory was to focus on increasing the blood supply of the tumor. So in order to come up with a principle behind it, let's just do a very simple exercise. And I'm going to see how many of you are really paying attention to my lecture. I'm going to ask you a question. Say. So if you are watering your lawn, and the summer is just around the corner, and suddenly the water stops flowing through this tube, through this hose, through this watering line, what are the potential reasons for it? S somebody blocked it, right? Or somebody stood up on it? 
that would do it. And what was the someone? So, fluid leakage, right? And indeed, that's exactly is one of the major reasons why blood vessels and tumors have sluggish blood flow, because they are leaky. And the molecule responsible for leakiness is VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. This was first discovered by our Harvard colleague, uh, Dr. Hal Dvorak, as vascular permeability factor, VPF. If you place VPF or VEGF on normal blood vessels, they become leaky. And once they become leaky, the fluid flow, the, the flow of blood or flow of water in this particular tube will begin to go down. So if you could somehow block this leakiness by blocking VEGF, then one should be able to increase blood supply of the tumor. Now here's a challenge. It's, it's not as simple as that. The reason for that is VEGF is also what is, is a growth factor for endothelial cells. It's a survival factor for endothelial cells. That means if you remove too much VEGF from a tumor, it's going to actually destroy the blood vessels. And then the flow will go down even further. So once we realize the role of VEGF or other permeability factor, in 2001, I put forward a hypothesis I refer to as normalization hypothesis, where the following concept was put forward in a nature medicine uh, commentary. What, what, what I, if you look at normal tissue, the blood vessels are quite structurally and functionally normal. Perfusion is normal. But in tumors I just showed you in the video, the perfusion is compromised due to leaky vessels and due to abnormal uh, structure of these blood vessels. So what we hypothesized in 2001 was that if you were to give an anti-VEGF agent such as bevacizumab or Avestin to these animals or to these patients, there are three possibilities. One is that these blood vessels are totally refractory to this, so therefore there will be no change in blood flow. The second possibility is that, and that was originally the reason for developing anti-angiogenic therapy or anti-VEGF therapy, or the reason for developing bevacizumab was if you have to increase, give a very high dose of bevacizumab compared to the VEGF levels in tumors, we would prune a number of blood vessels and actually we would decrease perfusion. What we proposed in 2001 was something different. Our thinking was that if you have to give judicious doses of VEGF, anti-VEGF therapy, such as a lower doses of bevacizumab, we would actually repair the leakiness, repair the structure of blood vessels, and the perfusion in the tumor would actually go down. It will go up. So as you can imagine, this was quite a provocative concept at that time because the pharmaceutical company in, in academia for nearly 30 years was trying to starve the tumors. And somebody comes along and says, no, really what we need to do is improve the supply of the blood to the tumor if you want to improve therapy because this way we can carry more drugs in case of chemotherapy and for radiation, we can bring in more oxygen. And in case of immune therapy, we can bring in more immune anti-immune cells or anti-immune therapies. Anti, uh, so with that in mind, we decided to do these studies in a number of animal models, and we did. And what we found was that that was the case. But again, we do not know if the animal models represent the human reality. So we decided to do 25 clinical trials in the last decade at Mass General Hospital. What I'm gonna do is show you a couple of those trials and, uh, and, and then you can draw your own conclusions. So the very first trial I want to describe to you was conducted in newly diagnosed glioblastoma patients by my colleague, Dr. Tracy Batchelor, who is the chief of neuro-oncology at Mass General Hospital. In this uh, phase two trial with 40 patients, what we found was that in 20 patients, after these patients received sidereniv, a anti-VEGF tyrosine kinase, a receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, in 20 patients, perfusion actually went up. In 10, it would remain stationary, and at 10, it went down. Now, if you believe in the prevailing hypothesis at that time, one would conclude that these patients where we are starving the tumor, where we're decreasing the perfusion, these are the patients that would live longer. But what we found instead was what, at least what we had anticipated, the patients who were perfusion went up, these patients had an overall survival, which was about nine months greater than the patients where the perfusion remained the same or actually went down. So this is support of this concept that what we can need to do is improve the perfusion in tumors. And we can do that by using the proper doses of anti-VEGF agents, such as bevacizumab or other tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Now we have seen this in five uh, other trials. And 
In the interest of time, I'll just give you the bottom line. We have seen this in newly diagnosed glioblastoma, in uh, recurrent glioblastoma. We have seen this in breast cancer trials, as well as in, uh, in a colorectal cancer trial. And uh, so the question that comes to our mind at this stage is, so what do we do about the patients where the perfusion actually, going back to this, how can we increase the perfusion in tumors of these patients? Our hypothesis is that one way of increasing perfusion in these patients is to lower the dose of anti-VEGF agent. Lower the dose of bevacizumab or whatever anti-VEGF agent we are giving to these patients. So before testing what's going on in patients, we decided to do preclinical studies in a mouse model. And what we found here was the same, what we had anticipated. So if this is a breast cancer growing in a mouse, these green, uh, this green color represents perfused blood vessels. So if you give to these animals 40 milligram of anti-VEGF receptor 2 antibody, remisiramab, what we find out is that the perfusion is lowered compared to the control. But if you lower the dose to one half from 40 milligram to 20 milligram, you see that more blood vessels get perfused. If you lower the dose further to 10 milligram, the perfusion becomes even greater, suggesting that if, if the patients, GBM patients, where who did not benefit from anti-VEGF therapy, if you could lower the uh, a, a dose of anti-VEGF agent, we would increase their perfusion and perhaps we would be able to increase uh, their survival. Now, currently we are planning this clinical trial, uh, but let me show you two retrospective studies that support this concept. The first study was published in 2012 with 200 patients where the overall survival was compared as a function of dose to these patients. And what these, uh, this, these investigators found was that the patients who received lower doses of, of bevacizumab had a 10-month survival advantage compared to the patients who received the standard dose, which is 5 milligram per kilogram per week. And this was true not only for progression-free survival, but it was also true for overall survival. So this was one retrospective study. Another retrospective study was published last year where bevacizumab was combined with external beam radiation therapy and these investigators found the similar results. The patients who received the lower doses of anti-VEGF agent, they had a better survival. These patients with the lower dose, lower than 3.6 milligram per kilogram per week, these patients had a better overall survival and better progression-free survival compared to the patients who received higher doses of bevacizumab. So the conclusion of this uh, part of my talk, I just wanted to say that any time we give anti-VEGF therapy to cancer patients, depending upon the dose or time, we can have excessive pruning, and therefore there we'll increase hypoxia, or depending upon the level of VEGF in the tumor and the dose of bevacizumab or other anti-VEGF agent, we'll have a window of normalization where actually hypoxia would be alleviated, you would have better delivery of drugs, immune tumor will be less immunosuppressive, and this is the window in which we would be able to improve survival of cancer patients. Now what we found in our studies was that there are some tumors, even if you change the dose, increase or decrease it, the perfusion does not change. So then we began to look at what are the other reasons why blood vessels in a tumor would have impaired perfusion. So we're going back to the same example, same schematic, you're watering your lawn and suddenly water stops flowing and there's no leakage, so what are the potential reasons? I think somebody here already answered it. There's a block here or somebody actually stepped on it. And if you can figure out who's stepping on blood vessels of a tumor, perhaps we can figure out how to remove it. And then perhaps we can improve perfusion in tumors and improve the therapeutic outcome. So that raises the following question. How do we know that there's a this solid pressure and solid tumors which is compressing blood vessels. How do we visualize it and how do we measure it? Now this is something we collaborated with surgeons and all of you have seen something in the operating room every day and I'm gonna show you how much useful information that simple observation has. So what I want you to do is do a very simple thought experiment with me. Here's an orange and you cut it like this and then you watch it and then you watch it and you keep watching it. What happened? Absolutely nothing. This is like 
an installation of Museum of Contemporary Art. And you can sit in front of it, meditate in front of it, and then you leave. And the next person comes and does that. Now what I want you to do is repeat the same experiment with a tumor. You take a one centimeter tumor, this is taken out from a mouse, and you cut it the same way we cut the orange, and do you see what happens? I'll repeat this. This is really worth watching. Um, because we repeated the same experiments with some of our surgical colleagues at Mass General Hospital, and we see the same thing in, in human tumors. They begin to open up like this. Whether you're taking pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, breast cancer, with Dr. Barbara Smith, pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma with Dr. Christina Ferrone, who will be speaking here, and, and uh, Dr. Carlos Fernandez. All kinds of tumors we have examined, they open up when you cut them like this. But if you open a normal tissue, it does not open up. Such as if you take the human kidney or a mouse kidney and you do a similar, uh, similar cutting experiment, it doesn't open up. And as an engineer, by training, that we can see there's a lot of information in this. So this is the original tumor, and when we cut it like this, it opened up like this. And using mathematical models of material properties of these tumors, we can calculate actually how much force a tumor generates on its own blood vessels while it's going inside the body. And the numbers we came up with are 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, up to 150 millimeters of mercury, depending upon the tumor type. And this much pressure is enough to compress blood vessels in a tumor. So the question is, what is generating this kind of force in a solid tumor? So using genetic approaches and using pharmacological approaches, what we have discovered that this comes from not only cancer cells and stromal cells, but it comes from collagen as well as hyaluronin, hyaluronic acid, HA. So we have been looking for ways of depleting collagen and HA, and I'm gonna show you one such approach. But what we found out that this is the case, this kind of pressure is generated in desmoplastic tumors, and about 25% of human tumors are desmoplastic, and one of the most desmoplastic tumors is actually pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma. And not only are the primary tumors uh, uh, desmoplastic, but so are the metastatic tumors, metastatic lesions. And they have abundant quantities of uh, SMA, hyaluronic acid, collagen, and other uh, components of the matrix. So we have been looking for ways to deplete collagen and hyaluronic acid from tumors. The easiest thing is give collagenase, but except that cannot be translated to patients. So then we tried a hormone called relaxin, which women produce towards the end of pregnancy. That can reorganize collagen, and that indeed decrease the solid stress or this compressive force in the solid tumors. But very recently, about a decade back, we found out the most widely prescribed angiotensin receptor blockers uh, ARBs or ACE inhibitors can also accomplish the same because they can also block the synthesis of collagen by down-regulating TGA-beta pathway, and they can also block the stabilization of collagen fibrils by blocking something known as connective tissue growth factor, CTGF. So to test this hypothesis, we treated mice with a, which had a high amount of collagen in their tumors with losartan, and so this is what is known as second harmonic generation microscopy. And what this allows you to do is look at collagen fibers in a live animal. So this is in a tumor growing in a mouse. And now if you treat these mice with losartan for about 10 days or so, you can see that most of the collagen disappears. And we have done these kinds of experiments with a number of desmoplastic tumors. And when we, when we deplete collagen and hyaluronic acid using this approach, using losartan, blood vessels open up. So what is shown in this slide, the, the blue color represents collagen, and green color represents perfused blood vessels in this particular tumor. And what you see here is that pre-losartan treatment, because of desmoplasia, these blood vessels are collapsed, and therefore you can see very, very few green colored blood vessels, perfused blood vessels in, the, in this region of the tumor. But if you treat these tumors with losartan, see that these blood vessels now become perfused. They were there, but earlier they were compressed by blood vessel, by the tumor itself. So, and when this happens, hypoxia is alleviated in tumors. You can deliver more drugs. The tumors respond better to chemotherapy and other therapies, and the animals survive longer. So based on this work, our colleagues at Mass General Hospital, 
led by Dr. Ted Hong, have actually initiated a clinical trial of combining losartan with folfirinox and locally advanced metastatic uh, pancreatic ductal endocarcinoma. But before we did this trial, we had one concern. Before my colleagues started this trial, our concern was that if these blood vessels open up, would they carry cancer cells and increase metastasis? So to answer that question, we first tested this in animals and we did not see an increase in metastasis. If anything, we saw a better effect on metastasis of this combination therapy. But in addition, we, we looked at uh, retrospective studies where, uh, where various angiotensin receptor blockers, ACE inhibitors had been combined with a standard of, uh, a standard of care therapy. And what has been shown in this, uh, this trial summarizes, this slide summarizes four such trials one on pancreatic rectal endocarcinoma, two on non-small cell lung cancer, and one on renal cell carcinoma. These trials, these four trials show that the patients who take angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors for controlling their hypertension while they are on the standard key therapy such as GEM or platinum therapy, sunitinib, as compared to when they are on beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, the survival is increased significantly. But again, these are retrospective studies, so we need to take this with a grain of salt, but our colleagues at Mass General Hospital are doing this trial, and hopefully this summer or this fall, this trial will be over. It's a small trial with only 32 patients, and we will know whether such a simple treatment is beneficial. So what I've done so far is discuss two potential reasons why blood vessels and tumors are impaired. One is they're very leaky and abnormal structure, or two, they are compressed by desmoplasia, desmoplastic tumors. And I've discussed with you our strategies, how we are repairing those, or how we're taming those blood vessels. What I want to point out is the biggest implication of a normalization is going to come in immune therapy. This is one of the most exciting area in the area of oncology right now. And what we know now is that a major reason why tumor microenvironment is immunosuppressive is due to hypoxia. What hypoxia does is it, it polarizes the macrophages from anti-tumor to pro-tumor, and impaired blood supply blocks the delivery of CD8 cells, immune cells, into the tumor. What our hypothesis is that if you normalize the blood vessels or the matrix of the tumor, we could alleviate hypoxia, and these oxygenated tumors will have convert the anti-pro-tumor macrophages, tumor-associated macrophages, into pro-tumor macrophages, and there will be increased delivery of CD8 eight cells and reduction in T regulatory cells. And as a result, the, 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 the environment becomes immunostimulatory. And if you are combined with immune therapy, whether it's vaccine or checkpoint inhibitors, the outcome will improve. So indeed, that's what we see in a number of preclinical studies we have done. For example, in a breast cancer model, desmoplastic breast cancer model, we find out that if you use lower doses of anti-VEGF receptor to antibody, remesirumab, it improves the outcome of vaccine. <clears throat> We've seen the same in uh, HCC, or due to uh, uh, when pay animals receive sorafenib, uh, that leads to hypoxia, that leads to a decrease in the infiltration of immune cells. But if you were to alleviate this uh, desmoplasia using, in this case, AMD3100 AMD or Plaxafor, we can see there's an increase in uh, the number of CD8 cells, and these tumors respond much better to, uh, to this therapy. And the last example is we have worked with a, a desmoplastic breast cancer model where these two checkpoint blocker blockers have no effect whatsoever on the survival. But when we combine these checkpoint blockers with angiotensin receptor blockers, we find out that the animal survival is increased tremendously. But the last point I want to convey in my presentation is that the biggest implication of even bigger implication of this normalization concept will come for non-neoplastic diseases that are characterized by abnormal vessels, and they afflict about a half a billion people worldwide. And let me give you some of these <clears throat> diseases, some examples. So for example, macular degeneration, where the blood vessels become leaky and uh, leads to, finally leads to blindness. And currently, there are three anti-VEGF drugs approved for this. And all they're doing is repairing blood vessels, normalizing blood vessels, taming the blood vessels of this to the, of the eye. The second example <clears throat> is a study done at Mass General Hospital. This is for the patients that have schwannomas, neurophimatosis. These patients lose their hearing. When you looked at the blood vessels of these tumors, 
who I found out that they were as abnormal as those of malignant tumors. So what I proposed to my colleague at Mass General Hospital, Dr. Scott Plotkin, who is the head of NF2 clinic at Mass General, that what we need to do is repair the blood vessels of the tumor by using low doses of bevacizumab. When he did that, uh, in the first 10 patients, in 60% of the patients, the hearing came back. And some of these patients are right now on bevacizumab for four years. And when they take bevacizumab off, due to drug holiday or other reasons, the hearing plummets. And when they resume taking bevacizumab, the hearing comes back. And as a result of this study, very simple 10 patient study, bevacizumab was approved in the United Kingdom last year for, for this, these patient types. And currently in the United States, uh, we are awaiting the outcome of a randomized phase C trial, and perhaps uh, the same thing will happen at, in the United States. The very last example I want to show you, this is the work I'm going to, is uh, on tuberculosis funded by Gates Foundation, where we have shown that the tuberculosis lesions also are very desmoplastic and the blood vessels are abnormal. And we have found that if you use low-dose bevacizumab, we can also repair the blood vessels. And currently, with the support of Gates Foundation and our colleagues at NIH, we are testing if this will improve the outcome of anti-tuberculosis therapy. And finally, the work which we have just initiated and you're seeing some very exciting findings that if you take very advanced cirrhosis, liver cirrhosis, which have very abnormal blood vessels and a lot of desmoplasia, a lot of collagen shown here, with the second hormone generation microscopy, if you combine both vascular and matrix normalization, a lot of this collagen disappears and the blood vessels of cirrhotic liver begins to look like normal blood vessels in the liver. So let me conclude my presentation by giving, summarizing some of the points that abnormal vessels and matrix create a hostile metabolic and mechanical tumor microenvironment <clears throat> that's characterized by hypoxia, low pH, and high interstitial fluid pressure. What I showed you is that these abnormalities fuel tumor invasion, metastasis, immunosuppression, and induced treatment resistance. What I also showed you, the vascular normalization can improve outcome various therapies, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immunotherapy, not only in the animal model, but also I gave you some examples of in, uh, clinical uh, examples, patients. I also showed you the matrix normalization can improve perfusion and desmoplastic tumors. This is especially true for pancreatic ductal endocarcinoma. And this in turn can improve chemotherapy and immunotherapy. I did not have time to show you our data on normalization uh, or to reverse advanced cirrhosis of the liver. But what I did give you show you some examples of how normalization can improve treatment outcome of other non-neoplastic diseases such as uh, wet macular degeneration, schwannomas, and tuberculosis. And very lastly, I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who contributed to all these findings I just summarized. My colleagues at Mass General and Dana Farber Cancer Institute who led these 25 trials, and I showed you the results of five of them. My colleagues at both Harvard and MIT, and many from uh, Dr. Andy Warshaw's department, who, who's our next speaker, and from our uh, breast cancer surgery group from sarcoma surgery group and dr christina ferrone along with uh, dr fernandez de castello and dr bob langer who is my collaborator in some of the work i described to you finally my colleagues in the edwin l steel laboratory and my the eight of them who are the pis who are assistant associate professors but really none of the work which i described to you would have been possible without the support of about 200 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows I've had the uh, pleasure to work with over the last uh, four decades. And I'd like to acknowledge them. I mentioned their names. So thank you very much again for your kind invitation. And happy to answer any questions if there's any time left. Thank you.